All right, gentlemen, so before we get too much farther into the book of Exodus, or really into the rest of the Bible in general, Old and New Testaments, it's actually somewhat important that we put some effort into understanding what kind of food they actually ate in that world, mostly because food is an incredibly prominent symbol in the, in the entire Bible, including what we've seen so far. I just um, haven't shown you this stuff yet because I thought there were more important analytical tools we needed before we got into any of the specifics. So here you get to watch me nerd out. This is a topic you'll see me get particularly excited about because I wrote a thesis about food in the Old Testament for my undergraduate courses. If you want to read it, I actually put it on campus, put it on on campus as I put this video up there. So um, it is there for you to see. Quick warning, it is 58 pages of Mr. Greeby raving about stuff, uh, so it may be too boring, but maybe worth a look if you're curious. Anyway, these are the things of the ancient diet, the prominent things that I actually already had in my cabinet. Interestingly, you're going to find that a lot of the things that get mentioned in the Old Testament are foods that you've eaten plenty of times. On the left, of course, I hope is a food you have not had too many times, a uh, bottle of wine. Uh, grapes are an enormously important part of the Middle Eastern diet. You cannot undersell the value of grapes and wine in the Middle Eastern diet, um, especially prior to the advent of stricter Islamic cultures in that part of the world, which really didn't happen until after World War I. There are now, of course, parts of the Middle East where you can't get wine because it's illegal to drink it, uh, but wine and grapes are incredibly important in pretty much all ancient cultures in that part of the world. In the middle there you see two bags of flour. There are a great many kinds of flour that were very important in the ancient world. Rye is pretty high up the list. White flour like you know now, as long as it's unbleached, um, you know, obviously bleaching flour is a more recent idea, but as long as it's unbleached is not that different from what they would have had. There's also spelt, which uh, you may be familiar with if you have more of an organic diet. And then there are other types of flour that you may only be familiar with if you're uh, sort of gluten-free, but rice flour is a big deal. And then there are, of course, other kinds, too. Um, flax, all manner of other things, basically. Buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat was very important, at least in Italy and Greece. Um, a little bit less so in the Middle East, but still prominent there. In front of those, I have on two plates... Uh, two kinds of other grain that would have been very popular back then. One is red lentils. If you remember, I mentioned red lentil soup when we were studying the book or the um, story of Jason, Jacob rather, and Esau. And I said to you that Esau sold his birthright for red stuff in the Bible. Most likely it was a soup very much like what you see here. This is a Turkish version, but it was probably just a Middle Eastern ancient version of the same thing. To the right of the um, red lentils, we have what's called bulgar, uh, or bulgar, depending on who you talk to, B-U-L-G-A-R. It's pretty thick as it's ground here, and what it's ground here for is a type of soup. You can boil it into the red lentil soup that I mentioned on the previous page. Um, you can also ground it thinner and actually grind it thinner rather and turn it into a kind of bread. To the right of that, we have olive oil. Olive oil in, is enormously important in the ancient world. Just as our American empire, in many respects, puts a lot of effort into getting uh, motor oil, you know, the kind of oil, petroleum, um, the Roman Empire was very, very heavily dependent on oil production as well, in this case, olive oil. To the right of the olive oil, we have salt and pepper, which stand in for the great many spices that would have been necessary, that would have been staples of that diet. The Roman Empire, um, which exists at the time of the New Testament, uh, had connections, trade connections as far away as China and India. The Greeks, prior to that, will also. The Jews don't trade quite as far and wide, but if you think about it, even they are influenced by the Babylonians, they're influenced by, um, you know, later on the Persians, but even if we just consider the Babylonians, who are based in Iraq, um, they have many, many spices also. So those stand in uh, just for a handful of the ones that we would have seen in that diet. When we speak of the ancient Middle Eastern diet, it is literally impossible to oversell the value of grain, bread, olives, olive oil, 
spices like garlic, salt, and pepper, as you see here, and grapes. Grapes, of course, becoming wine. Uh, the only thing, really, if you go over there that's any different now, is that there are certain countries where drinking wine is illegal. There's very um, sort of hardline Islamic countries like Saudi Arabia or Iran, where the consumption of wine would be against Islamic law. Even in those countries, though, grapes are very prominent, and in all of those countries, bread and olives are enormously important. People may think to themselves, well, this is interesting because those people seem to have had a very carb-heavy diet. Of course, in our society, we encourage a low-carb diet. But if you think about it, in the ancient world, a carb-heavy diet makes perfect sense. The idea that a regular, average, everyday person, you know, the average American peasant, if we dare use the term, can get his hands on chicken, beef, fish, eggs, nuts, avocados, hummus, all manner of other things that contain protein and fat, is, you know, without too much effort, really, is pretty remarkable. Those are foods that are difficult to make. They're difficult to grow. Meats especially. If you remember anything from your bio class is that if you want a 100-pound cow, which is a very small cow, I guess, but you know, let's say a 1,200-pound cow, we have to feed that animal 10 times its own body weight in plants because 90% of the energy that that animal consumes gets used. So a 1,200-pound cow would have to eat 12,000 pounds of grass. That's that, what, that makes meat very expensive. Nuts are kind of the same way. Um, they're scarce. They are important. Other animals compete with humans for them. And so they're not really worth going out of your way for. And as much as, again, cheese and dairy are going to be important in that diet, they're going to be luxury items. Because in reality, cheese and dairy, I guess it should be particularly obvious, other animals kind of want to use their milk for their young, and they don't want to give it up for humans. And so the idea that bread, olives, etc. would be prominent, of course, should seem kind of obvious. It just doesn't to us anymore. Now, once they're running away from Egypt, as we're going to see they are, the Jews are, under Moses in Exodus, the issue of this diet becomes very important. The reality of bread making is that it's a huge pain in the butt. Bread is simple enough to make, but it's not particularly easy, and it's certainly not quick. Nowadays, what we do is we throw together some yeast and some flour and some olive oil, some salt, some water in a bowl, and uh, we let it rise. But even that, you have to let it sit still for an hour or two, and then you have to punch it down. It doubles in size in that hour or two. You have to punch it down and then knead it and then let it rise again for another hour or so. So you're talking about even the simplest bread recipe with all the modern conveniences that we have today, still taking about three and a half hours to actually pull off. In the ancient world, yeast didn't come in little packets or in a jar. It occurred naturally in the air. It still does, actually and um, also occurs naturally on grain, and so it will be naturally in small quantities in your flour when you buy it. The problem is, it's not in a sufficient quantity in those places to actually make bread rise. So you have to give it a good environment so that it starts to reproduce. What you basically did was you left out a watery flour solution with some sugar in it, just kind of sitting on the counter, and it would collect the yeast from the air and from the flour and help that yeast to reproduce. Over time, what you'd end up with is this bubbly substance, which we now call sourdough starter. In the video you're about to watch, he's going to call it biga, which is the Italian name for it. Um, but it's really just flour that has collected yeast from the air, and it allows bread to rise. I would ask that you now actually watch the next video on this playlist, which is by a guy at the British Museum. He's got a bit of an accent, which I apologize for, but you should be able to understand him. Reproducing a um, recipe for bread that was uh, reconstructed from a loaf that was found by archaeologists in Pompeii. Basically, Pompeii is an ancient Italian city, an ancient Roman city that was buried by a volcano. And... More or less what happened is that a baker put this loaf of bread in the oven in A.D. 79, and then we found it in 1930 when we unearthed the site. So uh, this, this cook is actually going to reproduce exactly the kind of bread that they would have made in Italy, and it's probably pretty similar to how they would have made bread in the ancient Middle East, our context. Enjoy.